Can I have your attention, please? I'd like to welcome you to the afternoon sessions. Um, this is going to be a presentation by Brian Moscow, who's a registered engineer, a structural detailer, and a certified welding inspector. So despite all three of those bad things, hmm. I've heard his presentation before. It's uh, very informative. He comes from the uh, Car Carolina area, and I, and I understand you've worked up and down the East Coast, so we'll have to keep chasing him around. But he's going to talk today about what a welding inspector looks for, what some of the paperwork we need to do when we're writing WPSs. Mm -hmm. And if you just give me your attention, I'm sure we'll have to have a question and answer session later on. And I want to point out to you if we have any reason to, to leave the room quickly, the, both the burn segments are in the back there. And uh, without further ado, Brian. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And we're going to keep this wireless mic here in case anybody has any questions because we are recording the presentation. It's sometimes difficult when you ask a question in this direction, they're not going to be able to hear it. So if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please raise your hand. I'm going to get you this mic. All right. Um, so I guess this is a kind of a piggyback of a presentation I did back in October. I'm sorry? OK. Everybody hear me all right? <laughs> um, this is about how to make the weld inspector happy. And usually it all comes down to is paperwork. You're going to be inundated with paperwork. OK? Now, yes, this also has to uh, imply you have to have good welds, sound welds, good procedures. We're going to split this presentation kind of in two parts. The first part is about the paperwork that you have to provide the inspector. And then the second part is a little bit about the field production stuff that you have to look out for. There's three main topics about paperwork that you're going to have to provide. Now, remember, this is all on jobs that are governed by AWS. If the engineer specifies a, uh, a different spec, some of these things may or may not apply. The first main thing is a welding procedure specification, WPS. Above all, this is a written welding procedure specification. If, a, if somebody comes to you and says, well, I have a weld procedure, but it's not written, it doesn't count. All your shops, any welding production that you have, either in the shop or in the field, has to be governed by a written weld procedure. And we have several different examples of what a written welding procedure is. Also is a performance qualification record. This is the actual recorded values of a person doing the weld, either to qualify the procedure or to qualify himself. And then after that, well, the welding performance qualification is for the individual welder and what positions he's qualified under. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about is a welding procedure specification. AWS, in their infinite wisdom, decided they're going to create their own welding specifications that you can purchase for them at a nominal fee. And then you are uh, licensed, these are like site lessons, you can pass these around the room if you like. You are licensed to use these standard written well procedures either in the shop or in the field. The kind of the comeback on this is you have to use their amperage, their, their voltage, their weld pass heating requirements. Yes, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe not everybody speaks as loud as I do. Yes, sir. If a welding inspector asks for your welding procedures, are those welding procedures good enough for the welding inspector? Or do they, are they only there to be written off of that information? No, good question. A, uh, if a job requires written welding procedure specifications to be provided, yes, this can be used so long as your company has purchased the site license. But yes, these can be used. And that's what their intention, their intention is. Okay, and you see, yes, ma'am. <coughs> these welding standard welding procedures written by AWS are not pre-qualified. That's a that's a different okay. that's a different thing we're going to talk about, right? This is a little different. Oh. Before we leave these, uh, that's right. Yes, sir. Before we leave the standards, uh, if you go back about three pages into, if you go in three pages into the standard, you're going to see a small section where the engineer actually has to sign off on it and mm -hmm. accept responsibility for that document. So without it being signed, it's still not a valid WPS. So go ahead and read the details on the little sign off sheet. That's correct. And that's going to be the case on, on um, any kind of standard well procedure or even one that you've qualified by uh, testing, you have to submit it to the engineer for approval. Most often, most engineers, I am an engineer, most of them have no clue what they're looking at when it goes to a welding procedure. Sorry if there's other PEs in the room, but they're not going to know if the voltage is too high or too low, or if your interpass temperature is right. They're going to defer to a certified weld inspector or an expert in the field. But yes, you do have to submit these in for his approval before the job. Now again, this is what the code says you need to do, whether this actually gets done 
out in the field, I understand that this requirement may get slipped by a little bit. Next thing we're talking about is inside the welding procedure specification is a pre-qualified WPS. One method you can do to get a written weld procedure is you purchase it from AWS. Next one is you get a CWI or someone qualified to write procedures to write one for you. There's not qualified by testing or anything. He gets a piece of paper, sharpens his pencil, and he writes down through experience or education different requirements, the maximum electrode diameter, what kind of current you need to use, uh, fill pass thicknesses, and you can uh, because you look in the code book under Annex Q, that gives you a list of all the requirements that have to be listed on a pre-qualified weld procedure. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, this doesn't necessarily have to get approved by the engineer. A pre-qualified doesn't. Now, there's a little, it may sound a little upside down, is AWS provides a standard weld procedure, and they have dozens of companies backing up on providing uh, qualification record tests, and they've been reviewed by dozens and dozens of people, yet that still has to be reviewed by an engineer. With a pre-qualified written by one guy, he don't have to get approved by an engineer. That seems a little bit upside down to me, but that is kind of what the code presents. Um, the next type of welding, written welding procedure we have is one qualified by testing. That is, let's say if you purchase a site license of one of these standard weld procedures, and it doesn't exactly match what you're comfortable with in your shop or you don't have a CWI or another welding engineer close by that can write a pre-qualified weld procedure for your own, or you're just doing a non-standard pre-qualified connection or a weird application, you can qualify your own procedure, and there are several different types of tests that you would have to do, but you would come in with, you know, everybody's seen these old test plates, you run your groove, depending on what position you're in, you run your welding, either welding wire or stick weld in there, and your inspector comes in, cuts coupons, <coughs> He can bend them into different shapes. You can paste these around here too, but you guys probably all seen these coupons before. And if you're qualifying a procedure, you have to get it either X-rayed or UT'd, and you also go through what's a tension test. People call this dog bone, where they cut this out of your plate, and then they mill to a certain shape and pull it, and pop it, and you have to check the uh, types of failures it goes through and where it fails. You guys can pass this around. These are a little sharp, please be careful. Okay, and other requirements, if you're doing a qualified by testing or after you run your bead, your uh, CWI or welding engineer has to make sure it passes a visual <coughs> test. <clears throat> and say it goes x-rayed or UT'd, and then depending upon its thickness or your position will depend if you have to go through a side bend or an overhead bend uh, or a side, a side bend or a rooter face bend. And then we talked about the reduced section dog bone. Also, in some applications, you would have to do a certain macro etch. Yes, sir? I don't have the microphone. Yes. Uh, what is your personal opinion about this? I'm sorry, can you take it? On the standard welding procedure, what is your personal opinion relative to those? As about their effectiveness? By personal opinion, they, they're pretty effective, but you're limited. You have to use their parameters, and if you're comfortable with it, I'm pretty comfortable with their standard weld procedures. They've been used by quite a number of fabricators. Um, if you're not so comfortable, you're more than welcome to have somebody write a pre-qualified one or do one by testing. Is there you have a little bit of un, uncertainty about them? No, I just wanted your opinion on Okay. One thing also you notice that AWS, as far as I know, does not produce a standard weld procedure for MIG welding. Oh, oops, that's a big hole. <laughs> okay. You can get some for stick, some for stainless, some for sheet, go, uh, sheet metal, flux core, but not MIG welding. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And all I'm sorry? These are all tested by yeah, yeah, ABS ran all these PQRs and stuff. Yes, ma'am. You gotta wait for me to run the mic here. <laughs> well, I just wouldn't want anyone to walk away thinking you can't do a solid wire in structural. You can certainly test for it and even do short circuit and test for it. Uh, yes, uh, that, that is true. You can do a pre, uh, a, a pre qualified for wire welding or qualified by testing wire welding, except the, the uh, short circuit is not a pre-qualified process. That's right, but you can still test for you, it and still use it. Yeah, you can still test for it, you can still use it. I'm not sure how many here is doing like short circuit MIG welding. Excuse me. Uh, probably not too many. Yes, sir. You are using some short circuiting? No, I just uh -huh. wanted to make sure that we mentioned that the standard uh, procedure, welding procedure mm -hmm. from AWS is only good for building D11, not D15. So that, we don't absolutely. want anyone to 
think they can use it. That, that's absolutely that's absolutely correct. You can make sure any standard well procedure you buy from AWS either is D11, but they also sell some D1.3 standard well procedures or some aluminum or stainless as well. But right, there is no standard well procedure by uh, AWS as far as I know for seismic, or, or I'm sorry, D1.5 for bridge. You would have to either do a pre-qualified or qualified by testing on your own. All right, does anybody have any questions about three types of written well procedures? Okay. Next we have what, the, uh, what positions you are qualified for your procedure. We are just talking about the procedure, not the individual welder. Okay. If you have a, a welder run his test plate and he runs it in a vertical and then it goes through your side bends or face bends and x-ray it, your procedure is qualified for vertical welds and vertical welds only. Okay. Or if you run like a horizontal, you're qualified for flat and horizontal. The little confusion here is this chart differs a little bit for the individual welder qualifications. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about the PQR. This is the actual recorded values while you're trying to qualify your procedure. This is if you're doing a qualified by testing procedure or like with these standard weld procedures, AWS already ran multiple, multiple WP or PQRs on them. And this you have to have at least one PQR, procedure qualification record, for every weld procedure that you run. Some applications will require at least two. And there are some essential variables that are tied into that. And there's a, a chart, pretty good chart in the welding code that says if your procedure is written in a certain manner, you have a certain amperage or a certain voltage or a certain wire diameter or stick diameter you can use. You can use this procedure so long as you stay within plus or minus 10% or plus or minus an eighth of an inch. There are certain allowances they give you so that you can still use this procedure. If you fall outside of that, let's say you're running at 25 volts, but you want to run at like 29 volts, you've gone outside of the procedure, you have to re-qualify the procedure, okay, and the welder to that procedure, okay? And like I guess on, on the PQR, this is the actual written record, includes some electrical parameters, shielding gases, some other items. Next is our welding performance qualification. This is the actual recorded values of the welder as he's trying to qualify towards a procedure. Okay, I know we're talking about a lot of paperwork flying around here, but has everybody followed that so far? The procedure is a piece of paper that's sitting in a filing cabinet somewhere in the office. Okay? Or hopefully it's, that's, you know, it's out by the welding machines or readily available to the welders. But that qualifies the company to do this procedure, that process, that position. The welder performance qualification is the actual recorded values of the welder trying to qualify to that procedure. And on that, also, you have to pay us a visual test, face and root bands, macroach. And here I want to talk a little bit about the difference between a qualified welder and a certified welder. The language in the code is a little confusing. Okay? If uh, maybe you might have some of the welders go through like a, like a junior college or a technical school, and they'll get out of their school, they do a whole bunch of tests, and they give them a little diploma. And a lot of times these vocational schools will tell you, hey, they're certified welders. They are not. They are qualified. Okay? Qualified has a very specific meaning. Now, if you look throughout the code, they use the term qualified. You have to do a bunch of qualification tests. What certification is, is the piece of paper that is signed off by your, your contractor, your fabricator, or the, the CWI does the test. Okay? Here's another big question is, let's say I'm off working for a fabricator and I get a welding or a certification with that, that, um, that fabricator. I leave that fabricator and come to another one and they, hey, I got papers, I'm certified. He's not. He's not certified for his old employer anymore. He may be qualified to weld, but that paper certification is only good for his employer. So if you hire a welder who is certified with a different employer and he goes to a new employer, is you, any questions? No, actually, I encourage it all, please. I'm right. Doesn't the code allow uh, one engineer to accept from another area? And of course, there is AWS has portable certification as well. I'll bring that up. Sure. Yeah, and actually, in almost all cases, the engineer record can kind of accept any certification. Like I said, most engineers I run across probably won't because they're not sure what they're looking at. But we're talking about if we're doing certifications either with a fabricator. Now, if you go, AWS has a program that you become a certified welder you go to a AWS accredited test facility, okay? And you do a bunch of weld tests with them, you get a little laminated card with your picture on it, and it has the weld procedure written on it that you tested and were qualified and certified to. 
Now that card can go with you and you can, sir, you're a certified welder and you can certify for yourself. You can go to a fabricator or a contractor and he can accept that as certification so long as you're still using the same weld procedure. Now if that fabricator has a different weld procedure, you may have to use a requalify under that fabricator's parameters. Does that make sense so far? Is it a little confusing? Okay. It should be made a lot simpler, right? Okay. Okay. The next one I talk about when a welder performs qualification, the individual welder welds in certain positions. Remember, this is different than the procedure. If he welds in like a flat or a 3G position and he passes, he may be qualified in the flat vertical and horizontal positions. And most often, you guys, if you want to weld in like all thicknesses, all positions, you're going to run like a 3G and a 4G test. Not a quality follow you for most all positions. Or sometimes people run a 6G or 6GR that will run you one test. And also with a welding performance qualification, a very a big important thing, in order to remain certified, you have to make sure that you maintain continuity welding on that process for no more of a lapse of six months. A good way to ensure that is to keep a continuity report. Okay? Now, here's a big thing. A certified records whose effectiveness has lapsed, their certification expires. Not their qualifications, but the piece of paper that have has lapsed. Now, to help avoid this, you really should have a continuity record for all of your welders throughout all their jobs that they work on. Okay? That is the first half where we're talking about a lot of the paperwork that is required. Does anybody have any questions so far about that? Well, we have the three types of weld procedure, saying weld procedure, pre-qualified, and... What does the, the continuity report require? <laughs> it just says a continuity report, and there's no really format given. A lot of times, AWS, on the back of their code, <coughs> gives you suggested forms for their paperwork. There's not really a form or a format for continuity report, but they're just looking at this welder as welded with this process. Probably every job that he uses, you write down, he used this process over these dates. So long as there's not a gap of more than six months. Okay. So right. you said that they're still certified, or they're not certified, but they're still qualified. Yes. But 4.1.3.1 says that the qualification mm -hmm. will remain in effect. It doesn't say the certification will remain in effect. That's right. So I'm thinking that verbiage says that they're not qualified after a six-month lapse. Well, most often, if there's a six-month lapse, it's not six months in a day. It's four years or five years. I mean, it's, it's usually a little bit longer than that, and you would have the guy go through and qualify his record procedure again and recertify. But, and if you look throughout the code, it uses qualification everywhere. They don't use the word certification. So it might cause a little bit of confusion. Like a driver license. After five years, you'll still be able to drive. But as soon as your license expires, you're not licensed. Mm -hmm. Retest. The next few topics I want to talk about are you know, some certified tech welders, roof, deck, joist. And first thing I want to talk about is a certified tech welder. Yes, there is such a thing as a certified tech welder. And yes, your fitters in the shop are required to be one. Now, if you're a qualified welder, or I'm sorry, if you're a certified welder in certain positions, you're already taking care of tech welders. This is just usually for your fit-up guys. Okay? This must be welded according to a written weld procedure. Okay? And this is a little... A little dicey. I'm not sure how many people have certified tack welders. <clears throat> if you're going to weld up like a moment connection, you're going to tack weld the backing bar. If you're going to have the tack weld on the inside or incorporated into the weld, you have to make sure that the tack weld passes a visual test before you run your route. And you have to be very careful that you may be required to remove your tack welds by the engineer. Most engineers probably won't require it, but it is language in the code that may be required to remove your tack welds. Now, if you're incorporating the tack welds into your final weld, it has to make sure that it's according to the same procedure that you're going to use for that final weld. Like if you have a, a complete joint penetration weld procedure, your tack welder has to make sure he follows those electrical parameters, that uh, rod or wire. <coughs> to become a certified tack welder, it's a real technical, complicated test. You take this, well, this isn't exactly the size of steel that you use, a couple half inch plates, you weld a two inch long B quarter inch weld and you put it upside down like this and you hit it with a big ass hammer. And that's the technical term, big ass hammer. You have to you look at the weld break and the guy can evaluate it to see if it passes or not. 
and also with a certified tech welder, he's certified in that position only. And a lot of things I want to make sure we talk about, if you're laying a piece of plate down and you're tack welding it, that's a horizontal position. That is not flat. Okay, is everybody fine with that? If I run that weld be right there, that is a horizontal position. If I run it like that, that is flat. See the difference there? Yeah, they're talking about the face of the weld. So a certified tack welder is only certified in the position in which he tests. Next, we're talking about welding roof and floor deck. There used to be a whole lot simpler than it is right now. Uh, I gave a similar presentation to this back in October, and um, the types of rods and wire that you can use was a little easier. But uh, Volcraft and some other companies in their infinite wisdom back in October decided to change a lot of the graded deck they're using. You know, they think, well, hey, well, let's make them a little bit stronger. They made their deck a little higher grade so that they can span a little bit further, have a little bit higher design values. I think that's great, except now they make the welding requirements have to match. Okay? And one thing I want to be draw to, we are governed by D1.3. Here it says that when you're welding deck to anything that is larger, or I'm sorry, thicker than a quarter inch, the rods have to be low hydrogen. Okay? Now we're going to talk a little bit more about this low hydrogen in a little bit. Also, when you're welding roof and floor, floor deck or form deck, you have to have, guess what? A written weld procedure. This is not the same as the weld procedure when you're welding clip angles or shear tabs, anything by D1.1. This is a different weld procedure. Again, you can get a standard weld procedure from AWS for a small nominal fee, or a pre-qualified one written by CWI, or one qualified by testing. Uh, next, also, the welder, when he does his little weld test to become qualified in weld test, he is qualified in the thickness, the number of plies, and the coating that he tested on only. You're getting the, the gist of this? So if I want to weld to 20 gauge galvanized, I got to weld one ply of 20 gauge galvanized, two ply of 20 gauge galvanized. If I want to weld to 18, I got to run one ply, two ply, or even three plies if you want. I'm not qualified, excuse me, I am not certified to weld to painted deck. I have to do 20 gauge painted deck, two plies of 20 gauge painted deck, and then one ply of 18 painted, two ply of 18 painted. Okay? And also you have to run two of these tests. So it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit heady. And so it's like I want to run an uh, inch and a half B 22 galvanized roof deck. I have to make sure that I run a single ply 22 gauge galvanized, a double ply 22 gauge galvanized and do them both twice. And again, this test is real complicated. You turn it over on the side, you hit it with a big ass hammer, you look at the nugget and make sure the diamond of the nugget and you got good fusion all the way through. Okay? Next thing I want to talk about, a little bit about what we mean or about low hydrogen rods. I didn't actually put a spot on here. Um, I, if you're doing stick welding, any prefix that ends with a five, six, or eight is low hydrogen. Anything other than five, six, or eight is not low hydrogen. So how many here uses like 6010s when you're welding deck down, or 6022? 6022s. That is not a low hydrogen rod. Right, because we don't run across deck in that much until All right. Do you ever weld on roof joists? Yes. OK. The top cords of roof joists are 50 grade steel. Right. They require low hydrogen. Regardless, Regardless of the thickness. OK. So because this can get a little heady or a little complicated, I recommend use low hydrogen always. Because I don't know how often you're going to run across low hydrogen 60 rods. Um, also, you have to be careful if you qualify or if you certify on a welding rod like a 6022, you're not necessarily qualified to run on a low hydrogen rod. You have to consult maybe a CD about exactly what rods you're allowed to use and what you're not. <clears throat> but also when we're talking about low hydrogen rods, there's something very specific about electrode storage. Now the code is pretty clear. I don't know how many two people are following this. When you take a hermetically sealed container, your low hydrogen rods must be kept sealed. As soon as you crack that seal, oh. got to put them in the oven. Okay? And at any time that they're exposed, depending on the quality of the rod or anything, up to nine hours. If they're, if they're exposed for up to nine hours, you have to put them back in the oven. Now, I want to make sure this is called a holding oven. We're not baking them about 250 degrees, you have to hold it for four hours before you can use it again. 
Now, I know a lot of times guys will crack open the seal, put a couple rods in their pocket, and they well with it. But if they come back two, three hours later, they have to put those rods in the oven for four hours before they can use them. Okay? Now, if it's out exposed to the atmosphere for more than nine hours, you have to bake them. Now, baking, depending on the quality of the rod or the classification of the rod, can be anywhere from you know, 500 to 800 degrees, four hours, two hours. You have to look up in the code. And you actually have to bake them at pretty high temperature, and you can only rebake it once. Okay? And so I know a lot of times guys will get 70, 18 rods, and they throw them down on the ground, and use them all day on the job, or they're shoved in the back of the truck, and they use them tomorrow, and then they use them next week. They are not low hydrogen rods anymore. Okay? All right, and here is a little chart that I made up because the, the requirements welding to roof and floor deck have gotten a little bit confusing. I don't know how many guys out there use, you know, 1E one, one e painted or galvanized roof deck. doesn't happen all that often. But if you use a 1E, all thicknesses require to be an E80 rod. Okay? Not only E80 has to be low hydrogen, not only low hydrogen, that last little X there requires a certain low alloy additive to it. Okay? Well, that's not too, not too often. Not too many people use 1E. Well, let's talk about maybe if we use inch and a half 24 gauge. Okay, you have to use some weld washes, but you still need to use 80 low hydrogen, low alloy rods. Okay, you guys following that? Now, thankfully, most inch and a half roof deck, 22 gauge, you can use your E60 or E70. Remember, low hydrogen. Now, if you are welding a roof deck to like a bearing plate that's a quarter inch or less, you don't have to use low hydrogen rods. But then you're going to go a foot over and weld it to the top of your joist or top of a steel beam, you are required to be low hydrogen. Okay, so again, models just use low hydrogen all the time. Now we get down to some non-composite floor deck. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. If you do that little 9 16 conform, these are all Volcraft uh, classifications, but you know, CMC or uh, New Millennium are all pretty similar to this. Like a, a 9 16 or inch or an inch and 3 eighths kind of form deck again require an E80 low hydrogen, low alloy rod, okay? And also if you get into it like inch and a half, 24 gauge, it requires the E80. So and comp any composite floor deck you should be good with a kind of E60, E70 low hydrogen rod. The big thing I want to make sure we str strongly point out is that E80 low hydrogen for all E profile deck and E80 low hydrogen rod for all smaller conform form deck. Okay. Everybody, uh, I guess, pretty understand what's going on with that chart there. Not really. Okay. Any questions or? Well, I'm just trying to think if the code requires one thing. Is this a recommendation by the the manufacturer? Because I don't see it on their drawings. Okay. Great. What the manufacturer tells you, like Volcraft, you go in their deck book, they tell you what grade of steel they use, an A1008, grade C, or grade D. Okay? And that's all they tell you, with a minimum yield strength of 40 or 50 or 60 KSI. If you go into D1.3, that says if you use an A1008 grade, so you need to follow those parameters. Okay, so a lot of times, like uh, the joist or deck manufacturers will defer to D1.3. Okay? Yes, sir. This chart's a little different here. Yes. If you guys have a packet, and this is the one thing I got, this packet that we had was printed some months ago, and like I said, they, they just changed the grade of steel that they use for these two areas right here. But more importantly, make sure you contact your supplier and ask them, what grade of steel are you providing me when I get some 916 form deck? Right, here this old e -80, That's correct. Up there's E80 and down there's E60, E70. Okay. Next thing we'll talk about is we're, we mentioned before about welding to open web steel joists. The top and bottom cords are going to be a grade 50 angle, so you're required to have a low hydrogen rod when you weld to them. Okay. Kind of a rule of thumb. This is a rule of thumb. This isn't um, standard all the time, but if your joist is about 22 inches or less, they have these rod, bent rod webs. That's a grade 36 steel. If you weld to those webs, you can use a non-low high rod. If they're using crimped angles, it's usually 24 inches or deeper. That's a grade 50. Low hydrogen are required. Depending on the spans and the manufacturer, that 22 or 24 inch may be a little bit different. Okay? 
again, you'd be safe to use a low hydrogen rod. And all joist girders and long span joists, all the materials low is grade 50 steel has to be low hydrogen. Next, let's talk about an anchor rod. A few years ago, AISC wanted to distinguish between what a bolt and a rod was. And they've defined as a bolt describes a steel to steel connection. And an anchor rod describes a steel to concrete connection. So, change when you say anchor bolt, you mean anchor rod, it's the same thing. I, this is just a word that ARC makes sure they classify this correct. But, oh, let's talk back here. An anchor rod is now governed by a standard F1554. Three grades available, 36, 55, 105. The ends of the bolts are color coded. This F154 grade 36 rod is real similar to your old A36 threaded rod that you guys have always used, except they have a little bit more control or traceability. A grade 55 rod, if you want to weld to it, you've got to make sure you order it with a supplement, I think a supplement S1, so that you can weld to it. And then a 105, pretty high strength ones. Again, you can weld, if you have an A36 plate washer, you can weld to the plate washer. But you cannot weld to a standard, was it F436 standard washer that usually comes with these anchor rods. Can't weld to those. Low hydrogen or not, there's not like a qualified material. A lot of times you're going to run across uh, anchor rods that are using A307. I really don't recommend welding to them. You have a lot of embrittlement happen. It's possible to do, again, you should have a written uh, procedure to do it, but it, you're not going to get really good weld that you're looking for. Next also is a threaded rod, and this actually came up a few months ago with me. A gentleman put in threaded rod for his anchor rods. And that is not allowed at any time, anywhere, thanks for playing. And the difference is how they're manufactured. An anchor rod governed by F1554 starts its life off as a nice smooth rod. And then they cut the threads in. A threaded rod starts off with a little big diameter and they press the threads in. And when they press the threads in, they kind of deform the material a little bit so its ductility is less. So you can't use threaded rods for anchor rods. Now you might be able to use them in wall anchors and other applications, but not for anchor rods. And of course, you cannot weld to these at all. Okay. Next, we talk about welding rebar. This doesn't come. The, yes, sir. Welding. Something about the, for anchor rods. I'm sorry. Can you weld? Nuts. Um, there, if you have a written welding procedure that qualifies you for the material of the nuts, you can weld to the nuts. But again, you can also defer to the engineer of record and ask him, may I weld to the, yeah, these D1 nuts down? D1 does not cover that material. Does not address it. That's correct. D1.1 does not address the material in standard nuts, which is, I can't remember the designation, but it's, they don't address the material on standard nuts that come up with these anchor rods. When we're welding on rebar, First thing, and I put this, this first item up here, may not be used as a backing bar. <laughs> yeah, we laugh. Oh, I've seen it though. Okay, you cannot use a, a rebar as a backing bar. Also, you need to use low hydrogen, and here's a big thing you think, oh, it's a grade 60 rod, rebar, I can use an E70 rod. When we're talking about grade 60 for rebar and 70 rod, we're not comparing apples to apples. We're talking about like a yield and an ultimate stress, totally different items. You need to use E90. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> you also have the, uh, the carbon equivalency issue and the preheat issue with the rebar, right? That's correct. Yeah, make sure you do this long for me about trying to what the carbon equivalency is. And it, it is possible to weld the rebar. It is extremely difficult to do right and extremely difficult to get all your paperwork in order. You can purchase like what they call like this weldable rebar, but that is not an A615 grade 60. Okay, this is just your standard deformed rebar. Okay, next is welding over paint. No such thing as a weldable paint, no matter what a paint salesman tells you. Okay, there is no such thing. However, you can weld over a thin film of rust inhibitive paint but they never give you how many mils or how many thicknesses you can weld through. Okay? You know, you're going to weld some little bead like thin weld paint, you can weld through it. That's really not too much of an issue. But the best to avoid the problem ever coming up is to not weld over paint at all. And of course, you cannot have any paint within two inches of a complete joint penetration weld. Okay? 
does anybody have any questions about that second half that we talked about? Some of the tack welders, welding the joist, welding the deck, welding rebar. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. This is going back to the same What about welding over galvanizing? You have to actually, cannot weld over galvanizing. You actually have to pull it off. Okay. Now I know that's what the code says. Whether that actually happens or not, we can maybe talk about that a little later. <laughs> One thing also, too, you got to be careful about welding the galvanizing. When you heat that galvanizing up, it produces a toxic gas. Yeah. You have to make sure it's well ventilated and you have a, you know, a clear airflow. I'm not going to be around it when they're welding to it because it can hurt you pretty much. Some final thoughts I want to talk about. Some things that can make the weld inspector happy. When a weld inspector comes out to a job site and he's got some welders, okay, can I see their weld certs? Okay, well, that might be back in the office. The office can fax it over to your office. You'll have my weld certs. Okay. What weld procedure you're using? Oh, I don't know. That's also back in the office. Well, that needs to be either readily available to the welder, or one thing I recommend is actually laminate it and stick it right on the back of the inside door of the machine. Okay, that way, if you have anybody who grabs any machine goes out there, he knows what settings he can use his machine, what your company is qualified and certified to use. Now, if you open up any Lincoln or Miller, uh, Lincoln or Miller, a machine, you're going to see in the inside they have their manufacturer recommended parameters and that produced some pretty good welds, but that is not a written weld procedure. Okay. Next thing you want to make sure too is make sure your welders are certified in the process and the positions that they're allowed to weld. If I'm certified welder using FlexCore, I am not a certified welder using MIG or stick. If I'm certified welding overhead, I am not certified to weld in flat. Okay. And one big thing is make sure you, you maintain continuity proof for all your welders. And they said no more than a six month gap. Um, this is kind of a big thing is make sure you remove all your slag and paint before the inspection yeah. happens. Um, talking about making the inspector happy. Sometimes you'll go out there and you didn't get all the slag or whatever, but you knock off some slag and inspect it. This is kind of something you should be doing on your own because a welder should be inspecting his own wells before the inspector gets there anyway. And he can't inspect if the slag's still on. So make sure you knock the slag off, clean it off pretty good, and don't paint it until the inspector takes a look at it. And one final thing I wanted to bring up about reading all the job specifications. That includes the big fat book job manual that sometimes comes with jobs. You know what I'm talking about? I have a sample of a uh, particular job that happened a few months ago that, a partic that a, an erector got hurt on. And I just wanted to read a little bit to you. This was not on the drawings. This was not in the contract drawings. This was in that project manual. And it was buried in there. Uh, particularly talked about deck. Keeping deck covered and clean and protected against dirt, rust, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, all deck damaged, dented, or chipped, or punctured, otherwise deformed, including weld blowholes in deck from welding during shipping or erection uh, that shall uh, render it unusable or unsightly shall be replaced at no additional cost to the owner. Okay? I'm not done. The owner's representative shall be the sole judge as to whether metal roof deck must be replaced. During this job, before the metal deck ever arrived, the erector and the owner's rep butted heads about a couple particular items. And wouldn't you know, when it came time to put the roof deck on, he was particular about what he wanted. So if you're welding on roof deck, and sometimes you're welding down and you miss the top quarter of the joist and just move over an inch and weld again, that's unsightly. And he made him replace it. To make it worse, there's another thing in here. Next page, bridging. Make sure that the bridging carry out the design, particularly a visual alignment. This is make sure that particularly the visual alignment of the joist and joist bridging due to the structure being open and visible. What this owner's representative wanted the erector to do was to snap chalk lines and run string lines to weld his bridging. Okay? This was a real problem because the front of the building sloped to the back and then the side sloped so it was like a potato chip. Well, the bridging was almost impossible to get straight. It didn't matter. He wanted it straight. So I guess one thing I really need to make sure you recommend is you read all of your job specs because that book that comes with the drawings, whether you read it or not, are part of the contract, unless you somehow you know, very specifically exclude it. Because somewhere in those job specs might be this, and that can burn you. They ended up coming to a compromise. They didn't rip the whole deck off, but they probably ripped off just about most of it. All right? Do you guys have any questions at all about some of the things we talked about or any questions or comments? Yes, sir.
procedure for the project, are you going to buy it as an inspector on the site? Yes, actually, you can go ahead and submit a written weld procedure that you've gone through all the qualifications by testing and stuff. If you want to um, weld using either non-low high rods or something that's welded to something that's not quarter inch, there is a fabricator nearby where I work who submitted to weld to A992 structural steel um, some 7024s. They actually went through the whole qualified by testing, tensile tests and all that, and got that approved. However, on every job, they have to submit that weld procedure to the engineer of record to approve it. And most often they do. But yes, you can you know, supersede some of the requirements if you get the engineer to, to buy off on that. OK? Is there any other particular questions? I'm going to say 7024. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and they went through a lot of testing to get it done. No, not anymore. No, <laughs> this is several years ago. Yes, sir. I don't really expect you to answer this, but why in the world does AWS make this so complicated, so confusing? Because I would venture to say 90% of what you just covered does not get done. Oh, I would probably say 99%. Okay. okay. Um, this stuff has been in the code for years. Um, if welding inspectors or other people aren't holding you to a lot of those requirements, they probably don't know about them themselves. Well, Well, one of the problems, too, also you realize that AD 1.1, they're trying to cover everything. And to put that all in one, one book, they have to cover their bases for everything. So if you ever try to find anything particular in the well code book, I have a copy of it, they'll refer you to this spec, and that'll refer you to a table, that'll have a subnote, that'll refer you to another line, that'll refer you to a figure. And that's all throughout the code. I'd love for it to be simpler. But I wouldn't count on it in the near future. <laughs> Does anybody have any other particular questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, what, um, get back to that well procedure. Mm -hmm. I've been told by an inspector himself that that was not a well procedure. Which? Uh, the one that you actually, we actually purchased them from AWS, and he told us that that was not a well procedure. Well, you see where it says right on top? Not accepted. Well, if the inspector... Um, you would actually have to get the engineer record to approve them. Um, but if the inspector's telling me, hey, it's not, we're not going, I bypass him and send it to the engineer of record. You can if you want to piss the inspector off. Well, that's who's <laughs> telling me that it's not a, it's this, he told me that this was not a procedure. What did he tell you it was? What, okay. This, this was reference material to make a procedure, is what he told me. And you're going to write that. That's, uh, approved by the engineer right. of record. You can actually read in there, and it tells you it is a procedure. It is a procedure, and they include all their PQRs and stuff that you can call AWS and get research on. Uh, if you have an, ins uh, an inspector who's not accepting that as a procedure, you would have to tread lightly. I mean, you can submit it to the engineer of record, and like I said, a lot of engineers of record will just defer to this, the, uh, the weld inspector themselves. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I, I impress on all of you, do not, if you know, if you know you're right, do not hesitate to challenge it. Because it, it, in nine out of ten of them, well, lots of times, I say nine out of ten, let me take it back, in 50% of them, when he rejects that procedure, rejects that base, mm -hmm. he's just wanting you to buy his. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, essentially the same thing you said, sir, and I think one piece of advice is to ask the inspector to show you in the code where he keeps pulling that information from. That the numerous things you don't fight with the inspector, the page reference and model, all that kind of stuff, if they like it, you heard that. Ask him where in the code he keeps finding the information to justify his interpretation, advocating the interpretation. I've been in situations where we've taken it right to the secretary of who one one and they still won't see it. But they then start getting pressure from all those around them, which they can't per your code section there. It's great joke among AI and the auditors, they're all trained to read upside down because it's showing you where it's supposed to be. <laughs> nice or, or I have another thing where the inspector says, Well, I'll show you where it says, and he pulls out this D one point one dash eighty six. Something that's twenty years old that he's going by. Well, codes changed quite significantly in the past 15, 20 years. Uh, AWS will respond to a call if you call them up. Yeah. And we have talked to them about the standard procedures, and 
they will they'll tell you exactly where it is in the code book. Mm -hmm. You can click it open, show them exactly where it says it's okay for you to use it or do not want. Right, and they can uh, I guess provide a ruling or so. And they've been very helpful if you have a question concerning their code. They want you to use their stuff. That's why they did it. Yes, sir. I'm still confused about you, about your interpretation of uh, welder, uh, welding personnel qualification, the responsibility of that. Yes. If I'm a if I'm an erector and I, I draw from the from the uh, local, mm -hmm. and the local is providing uh, WQRs mm -hmm. and continuity. Okay. Is that legit? Well, are they employed by the local? Is that correct? The you know, the individual welder is right. employed by the by the local. Right. In other words, as the erector, I'm not maintaining that uh, that documentation is just being given to me by the union. Sure. Qualifications. Qual qualifications. The qualification right. record and the continuity. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You said okay. You understand? I do. Um, do you? Ha I guess. How would you interpret? Could you maybe restate it a little bit? So, how would you interpret that if you have a union? or uh, your local will supply the well qualification records or certifications to the fabricator to use. And we're right. talking about is he certified or qualified? Is that the, the question that you have? Right. I, I, I would accept that as you know, qualifications, but would you, would, yes, ma'am, yes, would you, how would you interpret that kind of rule a little bit? The poor contractors have got to produce continuity, and the iron workers are, uh, their pass books don't always give that to them. So what I tell erectors is it's your job to come up with a continuity on your own. Whether you take a copy of that passport, whether you keep the welder qualification, qualification test record and you sign it off for the guys that are working for you all the time, that as contractor you really need to be responsible for that continuity. Non-union, it's even easier because the guys are with you, you know them, you love them, and you can start from the day that they're tested and make sure that every six months you've written it down. So my interpretation is the contractor's responsible. D11 leaves at 1.2 that says the contractor's responsible for welder qualifications and also for WPSs. That's the certification part. When you sign the bottom, you're saying, I'm taking responsibility for that WPS. I'm also taking responsibility for the qualification of my welders and their continuity. Thank you. Does that help answer your question a little bit? Okay. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it's as bad as clear as mud, and that's maybe, uh, like I said, AWS has been pretty helpful if you need an interpretation from them. If you call them up, you will get a person on the phone, and they'd be more than happy to help you with a particular code item or question that you have, or a particular disagreement you have with an inspector. Ultimately, the engineer record pretty much governs. It can say, you know, these are procedures, but if a fabricator wants to weld it up there with bubble gum and the engineer signs off on it, the engineer is kind of his final say. Now, if the inspector wants to look at that card that's issued by the union hall through the AWS approved facility, mm -hmm. AWS kind of conflicts with itself and they <laughs> give them a one year expiration date. And you don't know whether that person's been welding the first six months of that or, or not. So and that's why I said it on there. The, yeah, sorry, the continuity report says typically six months. Uh, especially with sometimes your locals you can have go up to a year. Okay. Yes, sir. Did you mention that the continuity record for processing board? Yes, sir. Okay, I didn't mention Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're processing, you have to be uh, continuously welding on that process. What was the question? You want to know is the continuity report is process specific. I means if I have a welder who's welding wire welding for six months but then switches over the stick, that's not continuity. Okay? Well, I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the participation you can have. I have some uh, other materials and stuff that you're more welcome to come over here and take a look at. And if you have any questions, be more free to come on up here and ask. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.